Welcome to this uh, new lecture of your master course, Rural Development. My name is Tawseef Mehraj Shah, and I, as Lucas already said, I have recently defended my um, doctoral work, doctoral research work, and part of this lecture will be based on the results from my doctoral research, as in we will discuss them as uh, one of the case studies of what this lecture is based on which is using agroecological engineering or basically agroecology uh, in engineering food systems uh, with the aim of yeah sustainable rural development yes so um i think that's enough for the introduction <laughs> let's get uh, started with the lecture so this is a uh, basic outline or framework of this lecture what we will be talking about uh, it may not be in uh, series because um, uh, all of these uh, topics are related to each other. So we will have maybe repetitions or we will have yeah one thing in the other section. So this is not a section di division. This is just an outline, a list of topics which we will cover or we, which we will touch upon basically. We'll start with uh, linking agriculture and rural development. Then we will introduce agroecology as a sustainable uh, um, pathway for achieving sustainability in agriculture and sustainability in rural development. Then we will briefly talk about uh, systems approach <clears throat> in this regard, which uh, um, is about water, soil, food nexus, how these three um, areas of uh, research connect with each other then we'll talk about how agroecology um, or agroecological approaches can lead to uh, the attainment of sustainability sustainable development goals and finally we'll discuss about we'll talk about my research which was about intercropping in rice under the system of rice intensification yes uh, basically uh, since the course is about rural development um agriculture when we talk about agriculture we talk about or what comes into our mind immediately is rural areas um villages where people are growing food that will be consumed by the people living in the rural areas but as well as people living in the urban areas in the cities so basically if we are talking about development of the rural areas if you're talking about development of any kind, economic, social, uh, human development, basically in rural areas, agriculture plays a uh, important role or can play an important role in that. And, the <clears throat> and what are the challenges that we see in that pathway in sustainable rural development? Why as environmental engineers are we talking about rural development as at all uh, sort of you might already have learned that in the previous lectures so this is basically a maybe a recap of sorts um, to give you, a, you an insight into this lecture uh, for example um, water use in agriculture is a big um, component of the total water consumption worldwide uh, the figure is 80 percent of all total freshwater withdrawals worldwide is uh, ultimately used in agriculture. So that, that's a big number. And uh, why we're talking about this is because uh, we have almost one fifth of the world population who do not have access to enough drinking water or enough water in their lives for the daily use. So if we, if we can reduce somehow, if we can optimize the water use in agriculture, which is 80% of the total consumption worldwide, we could have more water uh, left for other uses for water scarce areas or water scarce uh, sections of the population. Um, yeah, and another reason is uh, even if there were no um, need for uh, water in other uh, areas like safe drinking water, still the current usage patterns would not be uh, enough to produce food in the next maybe yeah 30 years or so and in this uh, in in this uh, total 
agricultural water consumption, rice farm irrigation uh, takes the biggest share. That's the 50% of total agricultural water consumption. So that could be one of the areas where uh, agroecological interventions could fit in or could be applied. <clears throat> uh, in addition to that, there is a, a specific, uh, well-documented contribution of agricultural practices, different agricultural practices to soil and water deg degradation and contamination in some parts of South Asia. Uh, groundwater has become inaccessible, uh, inaccessible uh, for use because of uh, overuse of agrochemicals and agrochemicals are, and use of agrochemicals is, I mean, a result of agricultural strategies that are made around them. So this is how uh, we talked about rice, uh, rice farming, which consumes a lot of water. So this is how it looks like, uh, roughly. It's basically uh, a flooded field where rice is planted and rice is grown. There is a need to intervene there as well. In addition to that, farming provides livelihoods to more than half the world population directly or indirectly. And this proportion is even higher in regions that are more vulnerable to uh, ecolo ecological degradation and climate change. Uh, and these areas which we talk about are, for example, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So those regions that are already vulnerable and um, because of yeah, negative effects of uh, water scarcity or soil degradation, they are becoming even more um, vulnerable to these risks. And um, the current agricultural practices, which are by nature resource intensive after the um, advent of green revolution in 1970s or 60s, it is it has led to a decrease in the income of uh, food growers, which has resulted uh, in increased pressure on environment on one hand because of uh, increase of agrochemicals chemicals, and also has led to the migration of people from rural areas uh, to cities leading ultimately to unplanned urbanization, which is another uh, unintended maybe or indirect consequence of uh, failed rural development or unsustainable rural development. So, so how, based on these, what we just talked about, how are agriculture, how is agriculture and rural development linked? Um, basically, yeah, agriculture is responsible for sustenance of the basic human need in any society that's food. And the current efforts in different parts of the world, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, they are, they are uh, not being completely successful because of the new dynamic change, changes in the weather patterns as a result of uh, climate change and also uh, ecological degradation in the form of water contamination and soil degradation. Uh, and uh, yeah, so latest reports or even recently the International pa Panel on uh, Food Systems, Sustainable Food Systems, they released a report recently that there needs to be an uh, urgent transformation to agricultural system based on agroecology that are sustainable at every level, not just at a, one particular level to show off, but the sustainability needs to be there at every level, like which combines all the dimensions of sustainability, social, environmental, and economic. Yeah, like we just said, agriculture. If we talk when we talk when we talk talk about sustainability, the older approach was to consider social, ecology, or environment and economy as three different parameters to. Uh, to gauge sustainability in which people basically uh, would focus on economy and then say uh, it will just trickle down to the other uh, other sectors of the society for example but what has happened as a result is while trying to develop the economy the social and the environmental aspects have more or less been neglected so the new um, new approach to sustainability is this concentric circles model of sustainability which is on the 
right, where ecology is the overarching um, field, which contains the social system, which further contains the economic system. The message being that there can be no economy without a, uh, without a social balance, and there can be no social balance, but there can be no successful, sustainable society without an environment in balance. And agriculture spans all the three uh, sectors of this sustainability uh, paradigm. And like, like I said already, for example, in region like South Asia, environment uh, agriculture provides uh, livelihoods for more than half the population. So this is basically an introduction why we're talking about agriculture when we talk about rural development and sustainability. So we move on to agroecology. What is basically agroecology? So agriculture, agronomy, and ecology. When we uh, design or engineer agricultural systems, land use systems, or farming systems based on the ecological relationships that are existing, we refer to that subject as agroecology. Basically, agriculture with the proper uh, importance given to the different ecological principles. Yeah, so the study of eco ecology of food systems with the aim of transforming food systems with sustainability, this is what agroecology can be defined as. So agroecology is at the same time as field of study and also a field of intervention. So you could say I am studying agroecology and you could say I am applying agroecology to somewhere. So, um, yeah, it's, it's mostly, um, Agroecological interventions mostly consist of a set of practices. It's not a single practice. For example, it's not like um, in conventional agricultural technology, people provide uh, maybe hybrid seeds or new types of fertilizers and say this is the solution to your problems. But agroecology is all, most of the times comes with a series of interventions, a package of interventions, a package of uh, uh, practices that need to be applied on the farm in order to be successful. In the figure you can see uh, maybe um, just to highlight the difference between the current agribusiness mod model and the agroecological model that we're aiming at. In the agribusiness you see uh, divided um, uh, areas of application like there's a, there's a large scale industrialized mono culture farm and then the, the cattle is at a different place there is deforestation and ultimately it may be successful in the short run but ultimately it leads to loss of biodiversity but in agroecological farming you have for example multi-cropping systems you have agroforestry systems and you have uh yeah sustainable pasturing systems we have animals integrated into the system which ultimately leads to higher bio higher biodiversity which is one of the core principles of agroecology yeah, as we were just discussing now, agroecology aims at uh, protecting the different components of, uh, of the agro agricultural ecosystem, which includes soil health and biodiversity, sustainable land use and rural livelihoods, um, preserving water quality and conserving water resources, and local access to fresh food also ultimately uh, aims at uh, bettering the air quality. So why is, why do we need an agroecological approach to agriculture and rural development? Um, the conventional or the, uh, the approaches to agricultural development or rural development have mostly or mainly focused on yield, the, 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 the crop yield as the main parameter to to, to, to gauge the success of those interventions. But agroecology goes beyond that. As we can see from the figure, it has different uh, intersecting and overarching uh, goals. Among those, yield is also one of them. And not just the yield, but also the quality of the food, like enough access to quality, good quality food. So that makes agro the, the agroecological approach different than the conventional, traditional, industrial agricultural approach, which only aims at increasing the yield of the crops or maybe uh, increasing the disease resistance of the crops. 
uh, at the beginning of the lecture, when I was discussing the outline, we, just, we I talked about, I, I mentioned system of rice intensification. It is one of the agroecological approaches that we implemented in our studies. It's a set of practices that aim to make rice farming more sustainable and make it more resilient to different biotic and abiotic stresses. We'll talk about in, this in detail later. So how can uh, conventional um, farming systems be transitioned to sustainable agroecological farming systems? I'll just put my laptop on charge, just a minute, because I don't know how much it has. It's better than having my laptop to shut down immediately. Yeah, so how do we transition from uh, the current productivist systems, productivist in the sense that the sole purpose of these farming systems is to increase the productivity of the system somehow. Uh, that's the only or the most um, sought after goal of the current systems. Yeah, so we introduce better management practices, we introduce uh, or we reduce the um, chemical inputs and we introduce practices that aim at soil conservation and increase the bio on farm biodiversity. And we also use the knowledge of indigenous, uh, the real traditional systems uh, in that sense of the word. And uh, yeah, we substitute the external inputs with more and more on farm internal inputs. For example, in case of, uh, we could say in a particular farm, we can introduce intercropping beans um, and instead of external inputs of nitrogenous fertilizers, we could use beans as an on-farm source of nitrogen because beans are able to fix atmospheric nitrogen. So such practices, when we introduce these in, into our farming systems, we have a better, uh, more productive, more resilient, more environmentally friendly uh, agricultural systems, which are sustainable in the long, long run and can, can contribute to sustainable rural development. And such farming systems are designed to harness the potential synergies between different uh, components of the agri agricultural ecosystem uh, by obviously taking into consideration the different relationships between the different ecosystem uh, components. And so the question could be uh, which farming systems or which farms or which uh, uh, kind of agriculture can transition to agroecological farming. And the good news is both subsistence farmers as well as farmers who uh, are involved in industrial agriculture, large scale industrial agriculture, both of them can uh, transition to agroecological farming. Their pathways could be different. For example, if you have a subsistence farmer, subsistence farming farmer is, is a farmer or subsistence farming is uh, that type of agriculture in which the farmers are able just to only to uh, earn enough just to you know, survive. Whereas industrial agriculture on the other hand uh, is uh, the kind of agriculture where they use large machines and they use a lot of agrochemicals to further their yields to protect their crops and both can transition to agri agroecological farming following the pathways that are shown in the figure. For example, for subsistence agriculture, it could be diversifying uh, the crops they grow, uh, building knowledge, collecting the traditional knowledge that they, they might have lost over the period of yeah, generations, and also introduce certain degree of mechanization that could help them uh, yeah, on their way to agroecological farming. And for industrial agriculture, it could be, yeah, again, diversif diversification of um, yeah, farming is important for both because uh, promoting and conserving biodiversity is one of the main uh, planks of agroecological farming. And for yeah, industrial agriculture, one of the main um, highlights of this transition could be reducing chemical inputs. So we talked about uh, agroecology or we talked about agriculture 
uh, being at the crossroads or, or spanning all the three uh, sectors of sustainability that's uh, the eco ecological uh, aspect the social aspect and the economic aspect of sustainability so let's have a brief look at that how where does agriculture stand where does agriculture stand in this so let me uh, briefly mention in the introduction the different challenges current agricultural system uh, is facing so given that we can say that from a nexus perspective, from, ne from a water, soil, food nexus perspective, agricultural system has a lot of room to improve uh, if we see its eco ecological consequences, if we see the consequences of agricultural practices on the environment. For example, under the current rice cultivation system, a lot of water is used uh, to produce rice. Um, like I mentioned, 50 percent of the total, around 50 percent of the total agricultural water consumption is used in rice cultivation, which translates to around 5,000, up to 5,000 liter per kg of rice uh, produced. In Europe, for example, synthetic fertilizers are linked to an increase in loads of increase in nitrogen loads up to 80 percent in freshwater bodies, and agriculture intensification leads to loss of around thousand million tons of soil in Europe every year. It's worse in um, other areas of the world which are poorer in economic sense of the word. Um, so South Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, or maybe Eastern Europe, or also Southeast Asia. So this is the ecological aspect which we're talking about when we talk about agriculture or when we talk about sustainable intervention in agriculture. Moving on to the social aspect. Um, like we already uh, talked about this, agriculture provides livelihoods to more than half the world population and rice is the staple food for an equal number. So food and livelihood both are um, involved or both are uh, catered to when we talk about agriculture. And when we talk about food security uh, in areas where agriculture plays a major role, for example, rice. Um, in South Asia, rice is stable for more than 70% of the population. So when we talk about uh, food security, we have to talk about uh, the prices of rice uh, grains. When we talk about the prices of rice grains, we have to talk about how the rice is grown. And when we talk about how the rice is grown, we also have to talk about the yield of the rice. If the farmers are not doing good, if the rice yield is not um, good enough, the prices will be higher and food security will be uh, threatened, will be in danger. Uh, in India, for example, every year 10,000 farmers commit suicide because of failure of crops, because of uh, such policies that are meant or that are, that are designed uh, consciously or inadvertently to put uh, the, 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 the interests of farmers at risk. I mean, even today you have hundreds of thousands of farmers protesting in India uh, against such policies. So this is the social aspect we are talking about. And then we, um, the use of agrochemicals does not, is not, their effect is not only restricted to the ecology, the environment, even human health is uh, endangered because of, endangered because of uh, use of agrochemicals. For example, heavy metal uptake of arsenic, it's a huge problem in, for example, uh, Punjab regions of India and Pakistan and Bengal regions of India and Bangladesh. So sustainable development in rural areas is look, uh, linked from a social aspect as well to agriculture and how we do agriculture. Economic aspect, for example, again, talking about South Asia because my research was based on South Asia. Um, yeah, it employs around 60% of the labor force. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's probably easier to say this, but uh, we can imagine 60% of the people or, or the labor force is employed in agricultural activity and it contributes around one quarter of the GDP. So this is the importance of agriculture from an economic perspective in such regions which are most vulnerable to climate change and ecological degradation. And if we uh, introduce sustainable practices in agriculture that can lead to better lives for yeah, more than 500 million people who are living under um, 
the base poverty uh, line set by the UN. So there is an urgent need for such research, such interventions that, 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 that take the participation of farmers into consideration when designing uh, farming systems and designing cropping systems, also from an economic perspective. I'll uh, briefly mention some uh, success stories uh, of agroecological interventions from different parts of the world. For example, in 1998, uh, um, after the Hurricane Mitch uh, hit uh, Central American countries of uh, Honduras, Guatemala, uh, up to 40% more soil retention was uh, observed in farms that followed agroecological uh, practices as compared to other farms that followed the, the, uh, the conventional industrial farming practices. Also in Brazil, for more than 100,000 family farms, uh, yield increased up to 300% as the yield increased three times over because of agroecological practices and also led to an increased resilience of the crops to extreme weather events. Similarly, uh, you had uh, a decrease in the insecticide uh, agrochemical use by up to 90% in rice cultivation in projects that were conducted in uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and other Southeast Asian countries. So this is, these are the, some, some of the success stories, how agroecological or if agroecological interventions work at all. So we uh, mentioned how these three uh, components of the nexus, water, soil, and food are related to each other. And why do we need to take a nexus approach to, to these uh, challenges? Uh, so why is, we talked about food, we talked about how much water we are consuming in food and how we need, or why we need to uh, intervene there or implement uh, water saving strategies there for uh, sustainable rural development. Well, now we talk about brief, briefly about soil. Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's a stated fact that soils are responsible for producing 99% of our food because if there were no soil, there would be no agriculture and there will be no food. But soils also uh, are capable of sequestering atmospheric carbon and can hence be uh, yeah. Uh, instrumental in decreasing greenhouse gas levels in uh, the atmosphere and ultimately can then um, tackle some of the effects or some of the causes of climate change. And the soils are home to a large network of microorganisms that are essential for to maintain the quality of food uh, basically. So like I, like we mentioned, it's not just the quantity of food, but the quality of food as well. So if we if the microorganisms in the soil do not have the necessary environment to work to their best abilities, they won't be able to uh, yeah, provide nutrients to the plants they're assisting. And to have a, a good environment for those microorganisms to work, the soil health needs to be taken care of. I hope this uh, small video does play and you're able to listen because it's about maybe soil, how, how can healthy soils contribute to uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation. So for a few minutes, let's watch this video. Yeah, I hope uh, that was a brief um, sort of concise um, yeah, uh, introduction or maybe a uh, knowledge bite for to, to to explain what I was already talking about. You can also watch the video later again on the website. And um, yeah, for, uh, taking this further, when we talk about healthy soil, it also contributes to better water quality because soil has um, this capability of, uh, like I said, biological activity. And as a result, it can, there can be different chemical, biochemical processes which can fix certain elements, which can fix certain uh, components of the a, certain met metals or elements which are otherwise harmful for the quality of the water, but they can be uh, 
yeah, as nutrients, they can help the crops to grow. So soils also do this uh, process of nutrient cycling, uh, which results in better water quality. Because if we have, if we have, for example, uh, nitrogen uh, applied in the form of industrial fertilizers, which are that gets leached down down into the groundwater, it acts as uh, pollutant there, but if the same nitrogen is fixed by the microorganisms in the soil, it can be used as nutrients for the uh, for the plants. As a result, you have better water quality. But only when you have a uh, you have a living soil full of microorganisms that can do such job the job for you. Um, yeah, these are some of the uh, plans or some of the. Uh, goals of agroecological farming that uh, make it sort of a possible, a potential component of climate mitigation strategy. For example, this goal says if we increase the quantity of carbon stored in the soil by just 0.4%, 0.4% a year, we can halt the annual increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is a major contributor to climate change. So as we mentioned, as they mentioned in the video as well, storing using soils as a carbon sink rather than as source of greenhouse gas emissions by transitioning to ecological farming can go a long way in fighting climate change and as they say in the video the source for or the, the, the one of the solutions of climate change lies right under under our feet but for that our agriculture needs not just be carbon neutral but carbon negative and as a result we can have more healthier food thanks to agroecological farming. And uh, yeah, uh, like we already mentioned, agroecology uh, aims at increasing the biodiversity on farms. For example, in this picture, you can see a photo from my research where you have rice and beans growing together on the same farm. So now we come to the part of the lecture where I'll talk about my research as a example of how agroecological uh, interventions work in real time. Yeah, we already talked about this so briefly as a preface to the next section. Agroecological engineering is the using of the use of principles of ecology of agroecosystems to de design resilient and sustainable farming systems, which involves designing land use systems that contribute to food security, climate adaptation, and ecological restoration. And hereby, we lay the special spe special focus on uh, the maintenance and revival of biodiversity through different uh, interventions like cover cropping, multi cropping, or even intercropping. And how it exactly looks like is at single uh, land unit level, it consists of approaches that have goals of uh, increasing the yield of the crops, also uh, decreasing the inputs and, and decreasing the dependence of the farm on external inputs. Yeah, so for example, you have a, a farm which look like, looks like this, an agricultural farm growing rice, looks like this, a lot of water there standing, it just remains there, it's not actually, I mean, we can do better here by engineering this farm agroecologically to some, something that looks like this. You have the same rice crop that grows like this, which otherwise would, would be using that much amount of water, so you already have the step towards water conservation when you have uh, intervention like this. Similarly, if you have something like this, you have a rice crop where there are weeds growing these red, pink, pink color uh, plants that can reduce the, uh, competes for nutrients and reduces the availability of nutrients for the plants and ultimately leads to decrease in yield, decrease in the crop health and ultimately decrease in the income for farmers. We can have something like this where you uh, plant some intercrop, intercrop in between the rice uh, plants, which grows and gives you another source of food, another source of income, and also leads to a decrease in the growth of weeds. So this is what we 
called agroecological engineering. Like you engineer basically changes in the agricultural system at the farm level that leads to something better in, uh, in the end. Uh, so we'll focus on rice cultivation for the rest part of the lecture. Rice is a major world food crop with more than 60% of the world population eating rice as a main meal. We already mentioned it. It consumes a lot of water and also re releases a lot of uh, methane uh, as greenhouse gas emission, as, as a green, which is a greenhouse gas uh, 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide when it comes to its green, uh, global warming potential. Um, yeah, mainly in South Asia and Southeast Asia, people live from rice and rice cultivation uh, as food or as livelihood. So that's the basically the, the motivation why we took up this uh, uh, area of research. So system of rice intensification, basically, um, uh, these two, these few points uh, are uh, what makes system of rice intensification different than the conventional flooded rice cultivation. There is earlier plant establishment, that is you transplant the seedlings earlier as compared to, to the conventional system. In conventional system, you transplant the seedlings after four weeks around, but in SRI, you transplant them at one week or 10 days in this time period. Uh, in the conventional uh, rice growing uh, system, you have rice plants uh, planted, uh, multiple plants at, a, at the same place and uh, spaced at 15 centimeters around. But in SRI, you plant the rice seedlings singly and at a wider spacing of around 25 to 30 centimeters. And you do not uh, continuously flood the rice field under SRI and you yeah, prefer or you rather encourage the use of organic inputs like compost and do manual weeding using a rotary wheel kind of a thing that the man in the white shirt is doing there in the picture. So um, now we, we, we have a basic idea of what an SRI field looks like from, this, from here as well. This is a conventional flood rice field. This is an SRI field. So um, how does intercropping fit in here uh, in this discussion of SRI and agroecological engineering? So as I said, SRI is characterized by wider spacing between the rows of plants and is grown under alternate wet and dry conditions. So that sort of gives us an opportunity to grow another crop in between the wider space and also under dry conditions. Because if the field is flooded with water, you cannot grow beans there or you cannot grow another uh, intercrop there uh, that, that needs uh, like soil, that needs to be fixed in soil, that needs soil to grow rather. Um, otherwise, if we do not grow anything in between the crop rows, as you can see in the picture, there is a, there's a huge problem of weed infestation, like weeds grow because if if you have a dry soil or like not flooded soil, it provides enough uh, space and enough dry condition for the weeds to grow. And this needs to be either weeded manually or the other solution could be to grow something there, which would be maybe more economically uh, beneficial for the farmers as you can grow another crop and you you would require less labor, less time to deal with the weeds. So yeah, SRI provides an ideal scenario for such an intervention and we'll see how it works. Yeah, so you have a graphic representation of how it could work. You have uh, the rice rows uh, represented by the dark green and you have beans represented by light green. And how it works in reality is on with the figure of this man on the right. He is just putting one bean seed in between or at the center of the plant square, uh, yeah, as is shown in the graphic representation. So what could intercropping uh, lead in this case? It reduces the growth of weeds, thereby reduces the labor requirement. Depending on the type of uh, crop you grow there, it can either act as a mulching material to increase the organic content of the crops or also uh, act as additional crop, additional income, additional food item, or it can act as both in, in some cases. 
Intercropping has also been observed to reduce disease occurrence in different crops because if you, when you have a diverse uh, farm, there are different kinds of uh, plants growing there. So if um, if there is a certain kind of pest that attacks the plants, that attacks the, your main crop, maybe the I mean, if you it, it's a it's a it's a disease spread mechanism that when you have a similar kind of a crop or long distances the disease can spread easily or long long distances because you, you you simply have the same kind of vector like it's like the virus for example if you have human being human being human being human being at, at, at close distances the virus spreads faster so if you have a similar crop at, at shorter distances the disease spreads faster so if you have wider spacing between the crops the disease will spread slower or if you have a, another intercrop in between the crop rows that also sort of breaks the line of transmission of diseases and intercropping also adds value to sri and incentivizes adoption by diversifying income of the fruit and as well as food farms so we did experiments at uh, the duhh first at the laboratory level in which we, we measured some some of the parameters for example water use um, uh, there were there was water savings of up to 40 percent 39 percent in the sri experiments compared with the conventional flooded water experiments the f the pictures are uh, not from the th experiments they are from the field experiments to just to visualize this uh, finding from the greenhouse experiments um yeah we we also measured the number of tillers of the in the experiments uh and we can see in the in the flooded rise, the maximum number of tillers that was observed is 10, while as in SRI intercropping, the maximum number of tillers was 22, so more than double. This is how it looked like, beans and rice grown together. And the number of tillers is a measure of uh, yeah, the biomass and the yield potential of the crop. And the reasons behind this could be the early plant establishment, which we talked about as a salient feature of SRI, and higher nitrogen uptake, uh, which resulted from the intercropping of beans. So as a, I mean, these were just a, the, the two uh, parameters that I mentioned in this presentation. Uh, other par parameters were also measured as a result of which we concluded that this intervention or this innovation is fit for application um, in the field. And we went to the field experiments. And now I'll briefly talk about how the conventional process of rice cultivation looks like, and then I'll introduce uh, our intervention, how it looks like. So it's basically started, uh, or in the beginning, it looks it looks like this. You have a rice uh, um, nursery filled with water and you remove the seedlings and then you transplant them in water. And this is how it looks like, large swaths of land covered with water and with rice uh, seedlings transplanted into, uh, into them. Yeah. Um, the conventional uh, reasoning for flooding the fields uh, when we ask the farmers is to stop the growth of weeds but unfortunately farmers still have to use pesticides or weedicides herbicides to control the growth of weeds so the purpose the stated purpose of flooding the fields somehow doesn't hold uh, ground so how does the sri intercropping process look like you have the you, know, you have the rice green which is similar to how we, we do it in the conventional system you sow them here but on a dry nursery or on a wet nursery but not on a not on a flooded nursery as is the case with conventional farming you cover it to preserve moisture you have a dry sri nursery that looks like this and you transplant them at a time period of a week or 10 days or even two weeks then you transplant them singly in the field which is also not flooded and it looks like this after a week and after maybe 10 days you trans or you introduce uh, the bean seeds which then grows and ultimately you have two crops in place of one with lesser water consumption with lesser labor with lesser weeds with better plant health and uh, also with higher income for the for the farmers and let's briefly go to the results that we saw i mean okay before that before going to the results we'll briefly explain 
what could have led to the better crop performance in case of uh, intercropping system. We, as we showed earlier, you have a beam uh, sown in the center of a crop square. The corners of the crop square representing four different rice plants. So you have nitrogen delivery from the bean to the rice plants, which would have led to better performance of the rice plants. This works like this. You have a nitrogen fixing plant, in this case a legume, a bean, which fixes atmospheric nitrogen and uh, presents it uh, in the form of min mineral nitrogen to the crop, which then benefits from this uh, nitrogen supply. Uh, these microorganisms which fix the nitrogen, they form uh, modules or pod-like things on the roots of the uh, of the of the of the leguminous plant, uh, and they like they get sugar, they get carbohydrates for their growth from the plant, and in turn they fix nitrogen uh, into the soil. This is how uh, pods look like. This is not from my research; this is from another research. And as a result of this, we expect that the rice plants uh, to function or to 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 to, to perform uh, better. Uh, under intercropping conditions. And let's now finally have a look at the results. As you can see in the SRIBI, which is meant to suggest system of rice intensification with beans intercropping, in both the experiments in 2009 and in 2010, the intercropping uh, pattern had a significantly higher height, plant height, as can also be seen in the picture of that uh, uh, young boy. In his right hand, you have a, um, he, has a right, uh, he has a rice plant grown without intercropping, and in, in his left hand, he has a rice plant grown uh, with intercropping, and the one with intercropping is higher. The tiller number was, was also higher in case of the intercropping treatment which uh, further points out to the higher yield potential of the crops. And when we, when we finally see the number of uh, grains that, that a single panicle, a single uh, bunch of grains carried in case of the three treatments, we had uh, much higher um, number of grains in the intercropping treatment, which ultimately is the product of the rice plant, which leads to higher grain for the farmers, higher income for the farmers, more food for the farmers. Yeah, um, translate when, when we, the, the whole yield scenario, if you look at it, you had uh, the intercropping treatment had like 3.7 tons per hectare uh, yield as compared to the conventional flooded rice, which has 3.1 in 2019 and in 2020, it was even more, the, the improvement was even more as compared to the previous year and this, uh, also uh, translated into a higher uh, fodder yield because the rice straw is used as fodder for the animals um, in these regions. And if we had, for example, 90 units of straw uh, resulting from uh, in per unit of land, in case of intercropping, we had 140 uh, units of straw in 2019 while as in 2020, it was even, even more. Uh, and yeah, weed infestation, we already discussed about this, but once again, this was also one of the main findings of the research that intercropping leads to lesser weed infestation in the rice crop. And uh, this is how it looks like in the end. And this um, led to an increase in income of the farmers by up to 60%, I mean 57.2% uh, to be precise. But this difference, this difference uh, ultimately translates to difference between starvation and livelihood um, for the farmers, for the bulk of the farmers, because the bulk of the farmers in this region in South Asia are small farmers. And for them, even a 10% increase in the uh, income from their farms would make lives much better. And this 57.2% would be even higher if the compost is produced locally in those villages because the cost of compost, if you see in, if you see in, um, in the table, is the highest. And if, if we are able to reduce this compost cost, the income of the farmers could even increase more 
than what we observe in the experiments. Uh, I would like to leave you with uh, these reading recommendations, which you can, these books or these, yeah, the, the one on the left, Agroecological Transition is a book, while well, uh, the potential of agroecology is a report. Both of these are, can be found online, and if you can't find, just contact me for uh, the PDFs. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, I appreciate it.